Now this slide shows you a, a crystalline material and an amorphous material. So can somebody define for me what a crystalline material is? How do you define a crystal? How do you know whether this is a crystal or not? That's the key word. So the atoms are arranged in a repeating manner so that you know that if you find a particular atom at this point, you'll also find it at this point, this point, and this point. So we have long-range order inside the crystal. And this is one example where we have uh, green atoms and red atoms. If I know that there's a green atom here, there must necessarily be another green atom here, and you carry on for a very long distance. Okay? So they are defined by the long-range periodicity of the atoms uh, in the structure. Uh, amorphous material, the atoms are arranged more or less at random. Okay, so there may be short-range order. That means you know, one of these red atoms is surrounded by three blue atoms. But you cannot uh, predict where the next atom is going to lie or what kind of atom there will be. Can you give me an example of an amorphous material? Glass. Uh, so, um, what kind of glass? Sorry? Hmm? I can't hear you. SiO2. SiO2, silica glass. Uh, give me two more examples of glass. Um, quartz is silica. Uh, so. Uh, actually, quartz, uh, quartz can be crystalline or amorphous, the amorphous form, yeah. But two other material kinds. Uh, yes, polymers can be glassy, uh, you know, if they are below the glass transition temperature. And? Ceramics can be glassy, so give me one more. Uh, no, gas is not a, a glass, yeah. It's not solid. Metals, hmm? yeah. So you you can you can get metallic glass as well, right? Uh, you simply need to cool fast enough so that there is no crystallization of the liquid. And some people say that uh, metallic glass is liquid, metal, but it's it's frozen, right? That isn't uh, actually correct, because a liquid is able to relax at all temperatures. So as you cool it down, you know its density changes and other properties change. Uh, whereas a glass is actually frozen into that state. So its properties change in a different way as you cool the temperature. It does, structure does not relax. So the difference between a crystal and an amorphous material is uh, defined by the extent of order in the arrangement of atoms, long range order. Okay? But liquids can also be crystals. Can you give me an example of a product that you use every day which has liquid crystals in it? Hmm? Uh, yeah, liquid crystal displays. Yeah? So ba basically, you know, uh, the definition of a liquid is that it can't support a shear stress. Okay? That means it, can, it flows. Uh, so this is a liquid with uh, you know, elongated molecules and the molecules can slide past each other, therefore it's a liquid. But you can clearly see that there is some sort of order in this. Okay? Therefore, it's not a, a random arrangement of molecules. It's actually a liquid crystalline material. Um, there are different kinds of liquid crystalline material that you can get. Uh, and it's the alignment of those molecules which helps you to make displays. Because you pass light through it through an analyzer and a polarizer. And the analyzer and polarizer are crossed. So no light goes through that. When you apply an electrical field, the molecules align along one of those uh, grids and therefore allows light to go through. Okay? So liquid crystalline displays 
uh, exploit the fact that it's a liquid so the molecules can easily swing around if you apply an appropriate field. Okay. Uh, whereas, of course, in uh, solids, they can't do that. Uh, if you press the screen of your computer, you know, you'll be able to see that the colors almost flow, and that's because there's liquid in there. Right. Uh, this is a, a very beautiful picture, and what most people would recognize as crystals. Yeah, if you ask the person in the street to comment on what is this, they would immediately think it is a crystal, and some people even say that crystals have magical properties of some sort. Yeah? But, you know, we are not at the moment going to cover that. Uh, the main point is that crystals are recognized by the fact that they have a beautiful shape. They may also have color and so forth. Uh, but we are interested in a more general form of crystal. So, for example, this is a single crystal, right? Do you recognize what this is? It's a, it's a turbine blade for an aircraft engine uh, to work in the very high temperature region of the aircraft engine. And this part of it is a single crystal. Okay? It's made out of a nickel alloy. And what you do is you start solidification from here and you're solidifying in a temperature gradient so you get lots of crystals growing in this direction and the one that is growing fastest fills up this spiral and blocks all the others. And therefore, the rest of it solidifies as a single crystal. Why do we need a single crystal for something that's operating at a very high temperature, something like 1400 degrees centigrade, and rotating extremely fast? Why do we need that? Sorry, louder, please. Uh, heat expansion will happen whether it's a single crystal or, or a polycrystal. Creep. Why does, uh, why does using a single crystal reduce creep? Yeah, so uh, grain boundaries accelerate creep deformation. Why is that? What's wrong with grain? That's right. So the diffusion coefficient inside a boundary is higher than inside the volume of the material because the crystals don't match very well at interfaces. Okay? And you also pointed out that there could be some grain boundary sliding. So at high temperatures, grain boundaries weaken the material, but at low temperatures, they strengthen the material because they provide obstacles to the propagation of slip between crystals. So here, the crystal shape uh, is, uh, is an engineering shape. It, it's got an, uh, an aerodynamic shape which provides thrust for the engine. Nothing to do with its internal crystalline symmetry. But you will see that the fact that this is a single crystal makes it anisotropic. That means its properties are different in different directions. You know, you can see that very easily even if you look at the schematic diagram here, that the properties in this direction must be different from the properties in this direction because the spacing is different, the neighborhoods are different, and so on. And in the turbine blade, you actually grow the blade along a specific direction so that the elastic modulus is such that you reduce vibrations. You, you want as few vibrations inside an aircraft engine as possible. So you can exploit not only the fact that you don't have grain boundaries, but also that you can uh, grow along directions which will minimize vibrations during the operation of the engine. Okay. So typically this might be rotating at 25,000 revolutions per minute inside an aircraft engine. So that's very, if you have vibrations, that's not a good thing. So this, is, this illustrates uh, how the properties vary as a function of direction in a single crystal. So this, ba this surface, a vector from the center to this surface, represents the modulus. And a single crystal of silver, you can see that the modulus is not uh, constant. It varies as a function of directions. There will be certain soft directions 
which, uh, you know, if you stress along soft directions, then the amplitude of vibrations will be large. If you stretch along a, a stiff direction, then the amplitude will be small. Okay? And this is in the case of a body-centered cubic uh, metal, molybdenum, uh, where again you see that the modulus is not identical. It's only when we put polycrystals uh, together in random orientations that we can obtain uh, isotropic properties. But there is no metal or, or crystal in which you can get isotropic properties by a single crystal. Okay, so the vast majority of engineering materials that we deal with are not single crystals, they are polycrystals. Okay. Here is a, a typical example of an optical micrograph which shows hundreds of crystals which are packed together in such a way that you fill the space. So there, there are no holes in this material. When, you, when the crystals grow, they're growing from different points, they will touch and therefore they will fill all the space. And these are the boundaries between the crystals, the uh, so-called grain boundary. So another, another name for a crystal is a grain, you know, because it's like a grain of salt. Yeah? In fact, a, a, a grain of salt might itself be a single crystal. So we have these crystals and in between them we have some grain boundaries. And crystallography is not just about single crystals. Uh, we, we need to look at how crystals of different kinds, when we put them together, they behave. Okay? So we will have grain boundaries, and the grain boundaries will not be identical. You know, this boundary here, which is between this crystal and this crystal, will be different from this boundary here. And you can see that there are some special boundaries as well. So that actually is a, a, an annealing twin. And you can see that the shape of that boundary tends to be nice and straight because there are low energy interfaces which are uh, much more, much better fit between the two crystals than a boundary of this sort. Okay. So there's a lot of complexity in this. And uh, we can engineer that complexity to get the best properties. And the properties need not be mechanical, you know, they can be electrical properties, for example, uh, or magnetic properties, and so on. Yeah, so can you give me an example of a material where we control the grain structure in order to obtain the best uh, magnetic properties? Yeah? Silicon steel in order to get uh, uh, least resistance to the movement of domains magnetic domains. These pictures are now very common. Uh, the micrograph that I showed you first gives you the shape of the crystals and the size of the crystals, but it doesn't tell you anything about the orientation of the crystal. Uh, here, the colors represent different crystal orientations. So now you not only have the shape of the crystal, the size of the crystal, but also its crystallographic orientation. And this technique you can use on a scanning electron microscope or a transmission electron microscope because you get diffraction information from all of the individual crystals, collect all that, and produce a map like this. And you should realize that this is a very nice looking map, but there is a huge amount of information locked away in that. When you do an EBSD, electron backscatter diffraction experiment, you are collecting a vast amount of data. And in 99% of the cases, you don't make use of that data. You just look at the picture yeah, and present it. But in 99% of the cases, you do not do an analysis of the orientations of the crystals and how this boundary uh, interacts with this boundary and so on and so on. So you should spend at least a month on every picture looking at the detail and then you will discover something new. Yeah? Of course, you may not have time to complete your PhD, but you will be excited by the information that you see. Okay, um, 
Now I'm going to introduce you to a concept which is completely imaginary. It, it doesn't exist, but we like to find patterns in data, and this is a way of doing that for arrangements of atoms. Okay. So when we talk about a lattice like this, a lattice is an array of points, uh, it, is, it doesn't exist, it's in our minds. Okay. Uh, we are not yet putting any atoms on this. But this is a two-dimensional lattice, it's a square lattice, we have a, uh, a set of points here, and we've drawn lines between the points. Um, I could have chosen a different shape here to represent the same set of points. For example, if I draw this array of points, I could choose an oblique cell to represent the same square array of points. And there are reasons for doing that. But the main point I want to make is that we simply choose a square cell because it's convenient to us that the edges are of the same length, the angles are 90 degrees, so, and you know it does reflect the symmetry of the pattern. But there might be circumstances, which we'll come to much later, where we want to choose a different unit cell to represent the same points, array of points. And each one of these points can be the origin of this cell. They are exactly equivalent points. Okay. That's the meaning of a lattice point, that the environment of this point will be exactly the same as the environment of this point if I draw uh, many more cells around here. So these are the lattice parameters. There's an angle here which is 90 degrees and this is a two-dimensional uh, unit cell, square lattice. What does the P stand for? So I've said this is a square P lattice, primitive. What does that mean? You're right. Sorry? Um, yeah, so you're right. You, you said one atom in the cell, but we haven't got two atoms yet. So it's one lattice point per cell. You can have more than one atom in the cell and it can still be primitive. Yeah, I'll show you later. Uh, but it means that you have just one lattice point per cell. But why are we saying one? Because we've got four over here. Why is there just one lattice point per cell? How can I say that's primitive? Any ideas? Exactly. Yeah. So if I if I draw some more unit cells, you will have this point being shared by four cells. So only a quarter of that belongs to this. Okay. So if I add quarter, 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 I get one per cell. Uh, these are some alternatives where we've changed the length of the edge so that we have uh, rectangles. This is the primitive rectangular lattice and this is a centered lattice, a unit cell. So we have a, a, a lattice point at half half in a, addition to a lattice point at zero zero. Okay. So this, this, how many lattice points would this have per cell? Two. Okay, quarter, 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 quarter plus one. So there's two there. And this is the hexagonal, the primitive hexagonal lattice. The, this is special in the sense that this angle here is 60 degrees and this one is 120 degrees. But I could actually generalize this and relax those angles from those values in which case I could get something like this, and here the lattice parameter is also different. So this angle is now not, 60 not necessarily 60 degrees. Okay? So that's uh, an oblique P lattice. Now, the interesting thing uh, is these are the only possible patterns you can get in two dimensions. 
there are no more than five. So if you were making wallpaper,